quick one. If you'd like to support us on our journey to a thousand, please do consider subscribing or following this podcast wherever it is you're listening to this. Thank you. I want to be remembered for the for the work that I did and how I help people and um, how my work has, you know, whether it's my writing, how that has resonated with people and, and, and that can live on, you know, once I'm gone. So that's- CJ Lloyd Webley is a writer, a director and an entrepreneur and the founder of an organisation called the Black Pounds Project which provides affordable mentoring to black and diverse enterprises all across the UK. At the risk of sounding cliche, just don't give up because it just is a part of you. I think sometimes we try to detach ourselves from our purpose but when the two align, when your purpose meets your passion, you know, the, the possibilities are endless so just just keep striving and uh, I've always seen value in entrepreneurship so I've always seen value in being able to to kind of have um, a little bit more autonomy over my time having a little bit more flexibility particularly as a writer I sometimes just need that time to have head, a clear headspace but I'd set up multiple businesses you know I did a, I did a video on my YouTube about my first failed business which was a um, thank you for coming to A Thousand Voices, CJ. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Thank you, Tevin, for the invitation. I'm very much looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, for sure. Definitely looking forward to it as well on my side. And, you know, I've had a look into your profile and, mm. you know, had a look into your profile, seen your journey or whatnot. But what I always like to do with these interviews is to take it back and to, you know, set a foundation so people know where you're coming from and that kind of thing. So just to start off, could we take it back and talk about, you know, where you grew up, what the area was like, and yeah, just your upbringing, generally speaking. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in a council estate in Birmingham, so you can probably tell from my accent, so I presume you're mm. from the, the South. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, from, I'm from Birmingham. So I grew up on a council estate. Um, there was a lot going on around me, but fortunately I had had parents that really tried to veer me and my brother away from what was going on outside. Um, and I tried to channel basically, you know, my energetic propensities into positive things. So whether that was, uh, well, particularly at that time it was sports, so whether it was football or swimming or whatever it was, um, it was very much trying to keep us occupied so that we weren't just kind of, um, you know, out hanging by the shops and things like that. So um, there was very much like a, an area outside my house where um, we it was called a washyard. So the people were supposed to hang their clothes in there, but we just started playing football in there until eventually people stopped hanging their clothes and we just took it over as like a little football pitch. Mm-hmm. So that was very much my childhood in terms of, you know, growing up always outside the house where my parents could see where my parents could see us um just playing football and and keeping active and then you know I know we're going to go on to talk a little bit about my my arts background and things like that but the the way I got into that ultimately was um in school my uh my class was doing an assembly and uh, I just thought the assembly was boring it was I think it was about World War II and obviously it's really important to go into all of that but all the other classes were doing really fun, cool assembly, you know, topics. And I just felt like ours was boring. So uh, my teacher was like, okay, you know, we're going to go into assembly and, and deliver ours. And and I just said, I just decided I was going to do Michael Jackson. So I just went up there, started doing some Michael Jackson. And the teacher was basically, you know, mortified in the background because of course that wasn't what we were supposed to be doing. Um, But I saw that the kids were laughing and it was bringing joy to people. And I thought, you know, the teachers were all kind of looking a bit nervous and anxiously at my class teacher. But I thought I'd done a pretty good job. So I went back to my classroom and, uh, you know, I always tell this story, but my my class teacher, I think it was break time. And my class teacher was like, yeah, CJ, you're not going anywhere. You want to sit there. And then I was like, oh, what have I done? You know, I'm going to get in proper trouble now. And then she she basically, you know, she laid into me. She was like, you can't do that, blah, blah, blah. Um, you, it's not right. We had an assembly planned and all of this and that. And so, of course, it was nearing to the end of the day. So I thought she was going to start phoning my parents and telling them what I'd done and whatnot. But ironically, the next day, she basically was really, you know, jolly to me. Like, oh, how are you doing, CJ? Good morning, whatnot. I've got an amazing thing for you to do. Um, it's going to be a class assembly 
a school show, uh, it was Oliver Twist, and she said, you're going to be in that school show. And from there, like I say, she really helped to mould and channel me into the arts. And, and so instead of kind of going up there and just doing what I wanted to do, it was actually, I'd actually found a purpose for that energy. So sports and, and the arts was very much where where I was um, growing up. Those were the things that I was interested in. And uh, fortunately, you know, my parents um, identified that I had something in 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 that area, you know, a, a gift. And so they were supportive. But I don't think they thought it would become a career or anything of that sort, which it has become. But they were very much like, you know, good hobby, but, you know, let's get a job. And so, you know, that's I guess that's a cat coming from a Caribbean background. That's always going to be the case. But they're happy with what I'm doing now. So, yeah, that's a bit of the journey. Cool. That's, that's all good. And it's interesting when you speak about your parents there, um, being supportive of what you were doing. Well, being supportive of the arts when you were young anyways. Uh, do you feel like them, their encouragement when you was a child was important in you becoming the person you are now? Yeah, I'd, I'd say, you know, and it wasn't all, it wasn't all plain sailing. So pr- from childhood, I think, so I'd say under the age of about 12, I think it was very much like, you know, this is a great hobby. It, get, it gets him building confidence. It gets him, you know, learning how to to work with others and take direction and things like that. So all those positive things, you know, my parents was were really for. Um, but I think there was always this thing about, you know, you, you've got to get a job at some point. This can't really be a career, but it's a good thing of, uh, you know, good thing to be able to t- tap into those skills. And so obviously going through school, as I'm getting slightly older and I'm realising actually this is the route I want to go down, you know, I don't necessarily want to just get a job. I kind of want to do this as a career. And uh, it was, I guess it was at that point where that confused people because it wasn't what they'd seen before, you know, who are they going to, who who am I going to get guidance from in that area? So I think there's a little bit of a- of apprehension but they were always supportive of me um, doing what I was doing, particularly my mom anyway. Um, my dad was a bit more cautious, I guess, of, of like, uh, you know, how I was going to earn a living from that. And and so fortunately I had, I mean, I had the balance of both. So I had kind of the, the, the side of my dad saying, okay, well, you know, where are you going with this and how are you going to earn a living from it? But then I also had my mom who was very supportive saying, you know, go for that opportunity, go for this opportunity. So I kind of had the balance of both. And I think because of that balance, and because I kind of had my dad's thing of being, you know, wanting to be stable, I created opportunities for myself in, in terms of entrepreneurship and all those sorts of areas. So, um, you know, despite all the rejection that I, that I faced in the art sector, I was able to, to kind of build a platform for myself because I knew that I had to build something sustainable from this if I wanted to do it. And um, so, yeah, definitely the encouragement was was important. But I think also having that side of knowing that I had to do this, it wasn't kind of a a thing of, um, you know, let's see how it goes. Like I knew I had to kind of almost prove them wrong, really, to show that that, that I could make a make a, a name for myself in this. And, and that's what kind of drove me, really. That's real cool. So... It sounds as if, I'm assuming anyways, your first experience in the arts basically was that, that Michael Jackson rendition and then the Oliver, the Oliver <laughs> Twist, the school play. So mm. from there, because right now, I know you're primarily doing, you know, the playwriting, the direction, producing, mm. etc. They're all like behind the camera, behind the scenes type roles, which well, know, when you're young, you might not necessarily have that kind of exposure to that side of things you know we see the actors on the, the screen but we don't see who else is behind the camera and make things you know come to life with you so from there did you carry on acting like in school and outside school and what was your first foray into like well playwriting i suppose i think that's the first thing you've done right yeah yeah so that's that's a really good question and it's it's actually the reason why um that question is very significant let's just put it that way um so it was always it was always really about acting because as you've said that you know who who you're gonna talk to about the backstage roles they don't really promote that as well. acting's fine you know they get we get that you're on stage you're gonna do your Shakespeare or whatever play you're doing 
Um, and I did a lot of school shows and things like that. So my parents would always come and watch my school shows and my family and whatnot. And, and I really enjoyed the, the acting side of things. But I always knew deep, deep inside of me there was something more that I could give. Um, and I knew that I, I had a natural affinity for, for writing and, and literature. And it was a subject that I, I was quite natural at in school and did quite well in um, it, w- without having to try as hard as I probably did with other subjects. So I knew there was, I knew I had an, a, a natural affinity for writing, but I just didn't know that was a that was a thing. Like I didn't know you could be a playwright, like you could be the one creating stories and the narratives. So it was always acting, um, really, at, at, at that point, you know, until I literally went to university. So I went to University of Warwick and I was studying theatre and performance there. And it was when I got there that I realised, oh, you know, I'm not getting cast in things or I'm not getting opportunities. I'm not, you know, or even the things I am getting cast in, the director's asking me to do things I'm not comfortable with, or it's it's things where, the, you know, the stories that were that are being told, they're not really resonating with me. So I'm not, not enjoying the process. And so I thought, well, I just don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not enjoying this anymore as I used to, you know, it was, it was really fun for me in school. It was like an outlet for me. And then I got to university and it, and it started to become like this thing of, it started to become a bit draining um, because I wasn't getting opportunities for one. And then the second thing was that, so I was the only black guy on my course anyway. So that, that was always a factor. And um, that was something I come to expect anyway. I come to acknowledge, particularly in the theatre sector at that time, it was, I think it's getting a bit better now, but definitely at that time it was just, you know, you, you go to any of these programmes, you're not going to, not really going to see a, a sea of, of, of people of colour on there. So um, I I just felt that I there was something more that I needed to do. So I literally just, I, I think I was doing a module and uh, the module was about writing and I was like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll write a little something for, for this module. And, and um I realized that when I'd written it, so this wasn't the play that I chose to write, but it was it was a feeling that I had writing it that I hadn't experienced before. And then I decided, okay, off the back of that module, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and write a play. So I wrote a short play, I think it was about 20 pages or so, nothing long. Um, and then I put some feelers out there because I thought, if I'm feeling like this, there must be some other people who, you know, potentially want to act in a in a, in a show that resonates with them and things like that. So I, I wrote a, a short play um, about a family dynamic and there were just loads of people of colour that that came and wanted to be in it. And I thought, well, that's, that's crazy. You know, the reason I wanted to write was because I wasn't getting opportunities. So actually I wrote it because I wanted to be in it. But then I realised how many other people I was going to provide an opportunity for and I thought okay I'll take a back seat because these guys are really you know they're really excited to to be in it and be involved in the work and so it I took on that kind of back I took that back seat as a writer and a director and it just gave me a different feeling you know there's a feeling of being on stage the adrenaline and being in front of the of of the audience and whatnot and I'm sure it's the same with film as well you know being being in front of the camera but then um there was a different kind of lens I was looking through when you know you have people looking at the you know acting out the words you've written and asking questions you know oh what what does this mean or what does that mean and you're having to respond and and um search deeper within yourself to know why you've written it in a certain way and for me it was it was it was very refreshing and it was something like I say I hadn't had an experience in in that way before, and I just felt like it was it was just the burning embers of something of things to come. Because from that I was just like, okay, I think this is the route I want to go down. And I always say that as an actor, you know, you're you're purely you're merely a vehicle to tell somebody else's story. Obviously, you can bring your own nuances to the character. But, but really and truly, it's somebody else's story and you're now a vehicle to portray that. Whereas as the writer and the director producer, you have more of creative control over the process and the types of stories that are being told. So um, that, was where it, that was where it started. I didn't really know how it was going to pan out. I just knew I was going to try and pursue this as, as a career. And, um, you know, like I said, a lot of setbacks on the way, a lot of work that I had to do to develop my craft. But 
um, it, you know, it's paying off now. So, you know, I just continue. For sure, for sure, definitely paying off. And that's really cool to hear. So from there, you've, you've done your undergrad and you've gone to London, right, to do your master's. What was that experience like? Yeah, so I did my, so I went to London to study my master's in creative writing for screen and play because I knew that up until I went to university, my main kind of primary focus was always on the stage because that's how I that's how I got into the arts. So I just kind of went that way. But I'm sure that um, there's a lot of other people that may have been may have gone the other way where they do a lot of filming and things themselves and create their own little short films and things. So they go more the screen route. But for me, I was always on stage and doing things like that. So I thought I'm going to go to London and um, I'm going, going to try and study screen and play so that I've got, the, you know, I've got the double rep repertoire there so I can, you know, know about the, the, the difference between both. Um, and so I got on, I actually got onto the course with that play that I'd written, that short, you know, 20 page play. So I submitted that to my university um, and they said, yeah, there's, there's something here, you know, there's, there's, there's things to work on, but there's, there's some, you know, burning embers of something um, to, to work with. And so the, the experience of being in London was, and like I say, if I pin it back to um, my relationship with my parents, it was very much like, you know, we, we weren't a wealthy family. So of course I had to go to London and I had to figure out a way I was, how I was going to sustain, you know, my, my time there. So not only was that was I going to have to pay for my course and accommodation, but I also was going to have to pay for food and travel and whatnot. So I knew I know that London is is expensive anyway. So how how was I going to make that work? That was kind of always the the question in the back of my mind, and particularly when I had you know my dad thinking, okay, well how's this going to work? Then you know it's all well and good you want to do X, Y, and Z, but you, you got to find a way to make it work. You got to get a job or whatnot. So literally as soon as I got there I wasn't even thinking about the course I'd literally had some money saved up from the job that I was doing um, I was teaching for a little bit uh, as an art and drama teacher just a little unqualified job and then I saved up that money went to London so I knew I had about a month or two um, to, to kind of find something and I'd be okay but um, you know I knew that that money was quickly going to run out so I had to figure out something. So I was just applying for job after job. I was actually on Indie, just scrolling down, anything to do with the any, just anything really, just forward facing customer service, whatever. And um, you know, I couldn't really, I couldn't really find anything that matched the the, the kind of flexibility that I needed because uh, in order to do my course, I was going to have to have a job that was a little bit flexible. So. I could get to uni after after work and things like that and make it work. So it was a it was a very challenging time, and um, I ended up working security for a little bit, which was just crazy because I'm just not that kind of person to be saying, so, yeah, you know, I tried it for a little while and it just yeah, it just wasn't <laughs> wasn't for me. So I stopped doing that, and then um, I went and applied for some, you know. I don't know what they call them, like in-person sales. You know, when you you walk in through the shopping center and someone's like, "Oh, just a minute of your time, blah blah." I tried that one, and I was like, "Nah, come on, man, I can't be doing this." You know, I'm, I've got, you know, and and I respect, I fully respect people that do that kind of job because it's 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 very demoralizing when people are just saying, "No, no, no, I don't want that." And mm -hmm. it was a commission-based role, so if I didn't get any sales, I wasn't getting any money. So I'm like, "Nah, this can't work, man. I'm I'm putting more hours into this than I am even applying for jobs." So so I stopped, so I just said, no, nah, I'm not doing that. And then, um, to be honest, I, I tell a lie, I didn't even actually do the job. I basically told the guy I didn't want to do it um, on like the first day I got there. So um, so I didn't bother doing that. And then I literally just, fortunately, I was, it's, it's actually kind of a godsend really. I, I, I was, um, I called up a football team because I thought, okay, I'm going to try and, you know, get my mind off this job thing and just, just try and do something fun. So I called up a football team. I said, yeah, you know, I've got a bit of experience playing football and whatnot. Went to the football training, got into the team. And then, you know, I randomly just messaged the manager saying, oh, you know, I'm looking for a job. And he was like, oh, there's actually something going at my place. You know, um, call this number, blah, blah, blah. And it was actually like a, a, a flexible um, 
office admin role and I thought that's perfect that's exactly what I need you know that's literally like amazing and and the thing is it, it was just a testament to my um it just my tenacity really just to, just to ask because if I didn't ask I would have never never known and and so I was very thankful for that still had to go through the whole interview process he actually didn't tell them that he knew me he just let me have to go through the process which which was fair enough um so I so I got the job secured and I was like okay comfortable right so now it was time to to focus on my course now I thought you know I've been in I've been in this theater thing for a while I've I've written this this little first play um people people at uni enjoyed being in it and things like that and but me going to London it completely shifted my mindset so I'm from obviously I'm from Birmingham so things are quite relaxed you know you walk down the street you say hi to people you 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 get on a train you let somebody go past before you then I come to London I'm standing on the standing I'm standing on the tube station and I'm thinking you're saying okay two minutes to the next one I'm right cool so I'm standing there on my own I remember this vividly this was like literally the first week I was there I'm standing there on my own in the tube station and uh, there was no one next to me. Uh, the thing said, like, okay, one minute to go. Next thing I know, there's like 50 people standing next to me. I'm like, where did they come from? <laughs> and then the trains come, doors open. Okay, let this person go. And then another person walked in front of me. I'm thinking, is anyone going to let me, like, is anyone going to let me go on? I've been standing here for... So I had this mindset of, like, it was just a completely different culture to me because you know, London, you just got to get on the train. You can't be waiting around. And I think being there really made me, um, what's the word? It made me want it more because everybody wants it there. You, you can't you can't be standing on the train station saying, oh yeah, after you. You've got to just get on the train, focus on you, do what you've got to do because, you know, it's a different culture. So I think going to London definitely made me a more rounded and driven individual because I knew that everybody there just you know wants it so badly whatever it is even if it's just getting on the train they just just want it so it's a completely different culture and so um when I got to the course when I got onto the course uh, and when we you know just started the course so there was a there was an assignment to write a, a short a short play just similar to what I did at my, um, my other uni and, um, you know, I thought, OK, you know, I'm pretty good at this. And, and and before I went to London, I'd never really experienced critique in the form of like someone looking at your work and saying, you know, um, what does this mean structurally? Why have you put that there and not here? And have you really pieced that together? You know, why have you mentioned that? It hasn't really followed through. I hadn't had any of that. I would just literally written plays and people say, yeah, that's great. I want to be in it. it. It wasn't I didn't get any kind of feedback, really. And I'm thinking so. Because of that, I'm thinking, you know, I'm this, I'm a great writer. But then you get into a room with with people who are experienced. Now, of course, it's a masters, it's a masters. So you you've got people there who have got loads of experience, and they're just looking to kind of fine tune. Whereas I was really at the, they'd seen something in my work, but there was a lot of work to do. You know, I didn't know anything really about structure. You know, um, undertones, themes, all of these things, and I don't think a lot of people do when they kind of just start out which is a good thing because it means you're just writing the stories that are coming into your head you're not overthinking it so I remember I went into I went into a room with with a director and um we we're doing a little workshop obviously I've gone in with with my piece and I'm, I'm sitting there thinking so my first play was actually about uh three black men who are in a cell at Winston Green Prison talking about the, the their cultural cultural experiences so they all come from different backgrounds, but they're in the same place now. And they're talking about what they want to do when they get out. So it was just very simple narrative, but the, the themes that came out of it were quite interesting. And I remember this this white director, he was like, OK, well, I'd set it in America. And he was like, well, why have you set it in America? I'm thinking, well, just wanted to set it in America, you know, that... I've seen Shawshank Redemption. I've seen, you know, all the life, Eddie Murphy and Martin Lawrence. I've, I've watched a lot of American movies and the, the prison. And, and he was like, but, but wouldn't it be more interesting if you were speaking about an experience that you knew more about, which is, you know, you're a young black man. I'm sure you know young black men that may have experienced the criminal justice system here. 
you know, what, what nuances could come out of your cultural ex of experience of being in, in Britain and, and what the criminal justice systems like here and whatnot. And like, he was literally grilling me. And I was just like, I was taken back because I was seeing it as why is he, why does he hate my work? Like, why is he telling me my work's not good? But actually he didn't tell me my work wasn't good. He was just saying, he was just asking me probing questions to make me reflect and think, actually, why haven't I done that? Why have I just chosen to do it in America? And it was because it was all I'd seen. I hadn't seen really a prison drama set in the UK. And so I decided to reflect and I, I was, um, you know, I took, it took a day or two just to think about it. And I realized, you know, he's got a point. Let me, let me try and do this from my cultural perspective. Let me speak to people that I know um, and, and see what they think and what their experiences have been. Of, of the criminal justice system, maybe not necessarily directly being a prisoner but, uh, or a convict, but being someone who may have been stopped by the police or what are their perceptions of the UK police and whatnot. So I, I did that and, and, I, and I wrote this piece from, I, I redrafted the piece in a UK context. And I remember I was sitting, talking to my friend um, on the course in, I think I was just walking back to, Back to my shadow or I might have been in Nando's yeah I think I was in Nando's or something and I was talking about it and then um there was a guy called called Kevin who um I'll go on to talk about in a minute but he was listening to the conversation and he was like if you can get that written then I'll put I'll get that produced by the end of the year it sounds really exciting and I was like what like that's crazy that like, I was just literally having a general chit chat about the conversation he was like yeah I like this and I'm thinking okay like obviously I don't know. I'm, I'm remembering I'm, I'm in a new city. I don't know what, is this how things go in London? Like, is this, is this normal? Like you're just talking and, and just people saying they're going to put on your stuff. So anyway, um, I was like, okay, so that gave me a new motivation to think. And, and one thing I, one thing I did say before I went to London was, okay, I don't care what happens when I get there, but I'm getting something on, I'm getting a play on. I don't care if it's, you know, I have to fund it myself. I have to, find a couple actors make friends get people in to a to a little space and just put something on i said i've got to put something on because otherwise what was what was the point in me coming i could have done a course in 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 birmingham or somewhere local um but i knew that there was something about being in london you know and and to put it into context uh birmingham has one producing theater which is the birmingham rep where i work now so producing means they create they they um, have stories that people may write and then they will produce the play in-house so they'll create the set they'll create you know they'll do the lighting the sound and whatever whereas so there's only one producing theatre in Birmingham in London there's about 60 so that that's to put it in context if you write a new play in Birmingham the only place you can put it on is the Birmingham Rep unless you're going to fund it yourself whereas in London there's a lot more opportunities to do that um, so I just thought, okay, I've got, I've, I'm here for a reason. I want to get something on. So anyway, I um, I hadn't written a full length play before. The only play I'd written was that short 15, 20 minute play that I did at uni. Um, and this, um, it was called Shadows, this piece uh, set in the prison. It was only about 10 pages at that point. So a full length play, to put it into context, is about 70 to 90 pages. And obviously, if I'm setting this in a prison, I've got to think about how I'm going to sustain that drama for that amount of amount of time. Um, but I sent, so I, I must have sent him what I felt like I didn't know the the full length of a play. I didn't know how long they typically are or how they run. I think I knew that they ran for about you know one act plays about one hour or something like that. Two act plays about two hours ten. So I knew that. I could probably write a one act play, like an hour, but I didn't know how many pages that would equate to. So it's usually about a page a minute. Um, so I wrote about 40 pages, I think, and I sent it to him. I was like, yeah, I've written 40 pages, um, finished. Let's let's get this show on the road. And he was like, he, he read it. I think he took about, probably took about three days to come back to me. So I thought, oh, this, this guy's a joker. You know, I've waited all that time um, writing. That I've been putting all my heart and soul into this and the man didn't even responded to my email so I thought nah this guy's a joker but at least I've got something written 
anyway, he comes back to me. He's like, oh, um, he, he's like, and he's American guys. He's like, hey, you know, um, you know, we got a got a got a bit to work on, and it's a bit short, but you know, we we, we can work with that. We can work with that. <laughs> and I was like, okay, mm -hmm. cool. So when you say short, what do you mean? He's like, mm, yeah, we gotta we gotta double it. We gotta double the pages. And I was like, double the pages. How am I gonna double the pages? And I'm forty pages sitting in a prison cell. Like, what more can I do? And then, you know, so obviously, as I'm going through the course as well, I'm I'm learning and I'm developing, um, and and I'm understanding more about how you how you hold things back and and let them come out a little bit later. So, um, long story short, I, I he did end up producing that that play uh, um, in the 2017 when I was there. And it ended up getting four and five star reviews, and and um, so I I kind of I do always have to mention him because he was the first person that that believed in me to to back me enough to to put my work on and and to put into context as well. We put it on three nights in King's Cross, and uh, that costed a little over twenty thousand. So he put twenty thousand pound of his own money into putting my play on. And it also made me realize why people don't put work on themselves because it's expensive, especially if you want it to be a certain quality. You want to get actors in, professional actors. You've got to pay them for their time in rehearsals. You've got to pay them for the performances um, and, and anything like a Q&A or interview. So it's all those equity rates and things like that, which people don't typically know about. And so um being in london just taught me that it taught me a lot about the industry and so i think because of that experience my, my career kind of fast tracked really because because i was able to fortunately have a good support network around me and and um so yeah and and learning about screen was great as well on the course that's cool that's a really cool story actually man. shout out to kevin <laughs> for that hand up when when he was in london I listened, I watched the promo video for Shadows, yeah? Let me get this up, hold up. Yeah. I watched the promo, yeah? And there was, I thought it looked, it looked deep, man. <laughs> there were some deep lines in that. And then I got this line here. I wrote it down. It's, um, our history is all we have left. If we don't have that, then what are we? Just shadows that they can walk all over. And I thought, yo, that's, that sounds deep. So what I want to ask is, with Shadows, what was you how do I even put it? Like, what kind of message were you trying to convey with it? Or what kind of questions were you trying to ask with that play? So really, really, really good um, questions. It, it's, the play has, has since progressed because it was, like I say, first play I'd written and that was 2017. So um, the questions at that time, I think I was asking was, what does it mean to be a black person growing up in Britain? Is it to do with the cultural history that you've been taught? Or is it about your experience growing up in, in this country? Because I think there's, there, there is a, a common thing that, that always seems to come up about um, when we think about the black community. You know, I, I see community as people that think in a similar way or know how to reason in a similar way um so i'd say that black culture and black community are different because you can be a part of a particular community but you don't necessarily reason or or deal with things in in a, in a certain way but whereas the culture is something that you can't really hide away from because it's it's ingrained in you it's the way you've been raised it's the way you've been brought up so um the piece was all about if they are in the same context which is this prison they they are part of a prison culture but they didn't necessarily come from so these three characters Balak, Edmund and Chase they didn't come from a similar community so what is the contention between them because of that and is there an expectation from Edmund who's the guy who who said that line is there an expectation that everybody should think the same way as him because he's the oldest and he's the one who knows the most about his history? Um, and so it, it was all about trying to piece together what it actually means to be black and why um, we we put this pressure on ourselves to to think and feel the same when actually 
all of our experiences might be might be different. The only thing we have to do really is respect where we've come from, respect the people that have come before us and what and what their journeys have been. But actually we can live the way we choose to live and we don't have to um and, and I guess the question is do we have to live in a certain way or be a certain way to project our culture, you know, because it's something that that existed pre, you know, way before we even got here. So we we just are, do you know what I mean? And that's that's why it's why can't we just be? Why is there a pressure to to um perform a, a certain or ill rather is there a question is there a question about performing who we are and so you've got the the younger guy who so the younger guy chase he's in there because of a poor life decision they're all in there for poor life decisions but for him he just did something very silly um whereas with the older guy he did something very um a lot worse in you know in to put it that way but they're all in there they're all in there together so it does the, the perception is they're all they're all prisoners but the the, the questions that come out of the, the conversations that they're having is um he, he's almost telling edmund's almost telling the younger guy you look you're just like me we're all in here we're all from the same culture we're all from the same background they're out to get you but actually what he did was completely different to what he did but he's kind of playing it off as though they're all the same. Um, and he's kind of trying to make everybody join him on this pursuit of kind of, um, you know, stick it to the man sort of mentality. But I mean, the thing is, it's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic because they all have, they all have valid points that all three of them have valid points. And, and hopefully I will be able to get the, the play on again in the future. Um, you know, as I've just mentioned, quite expensive, but I, I do think it needs to go on again because it's it raises questions that I think are often seldom voiced. We don't speak about them um, because we, we're almost afraid to, to oppose, you know, each other. But at times we need to be comfortable in, in, in having a difference of opinion. You know, my opinion is that, yes, we need to embrace our culture, we need to embrace our heritage, but understand that people's the way people choose to display that may be different than what you are used to. And so we need to we need to it's kind of a, a play about coming together um, and what the effects are if we don't do that. That's real cool. That's really interesting, actually. And I feel I hear what you're saying. I feel that a lot of the times with a lot of questions are asked, there isn't necessarily like a one set defined answer anyways. So you've got three different characters there with three different perspectives. Um, and it isn't necessarily like, oh, Edmund's right and Chase is wrong or whatever. It's just everybody has their own answers based on their own lived life experience, if you know what I'm saying. So one person's lived one sort of life and then, okay, that's his answer to the question. This is what it means to be black. Someone else has lived this life. Okay, this is what it means to be black. But yeah, I don't, I don't feel that's like a one set definition. It's like, it's, it's whatever it is to you. You know what I'm saying? It's your experience, your life, be you. But that's cool, man. That sounds real cool. And I know since then you've worked on a few other different plays in different capacities, you know, writing, directing, etc. But you know, you've been working for a while now. Where do you get your inspiration for from when you're on these different plays you work on? So when I'm I, I normally only really take on projects that I'm that I'm passionate about because I've realized that if it's not a project that resonates with me, I'd rather just signpost it because I'd signpost it to someone else um, because I, I don't like it to feel like work. I like it to feel like a journey that I'm going on, a journey of discovery. Um, I don't typically like to direct my own work as well because I, I always like to get an outside perspective um, because they will be able to drink to draw things out of the script that you may not have known because sometimes when you've written it you've been working on it it usually takes me to, to do a first draft it, I'm trying to get quicker at doing them but it normally takes me around a year probably to to write a draft so I'm trying to get quicker at doing them but um it's because it's such a I find that with writing it it 
it depends on my frame of mind. Like if something's going on in my life at that particular time, it's hard to focus on a story um, that might have nothing to do with with what what's going on at, on that at that particular time. Because usually, you know, as a writer, we're we're drawing inspiration from what's around us. And if if I'm going through something, um, you know, at the time that doesn't it just doesn't feel connected. Everything becomes disjointed. So it takes sometimes a bit of time and for me to to go away from from my home environment. You know, I may need to go and and write in a in a in a countryside for a, for a few nights just to, to be able to focus. So um, I draw inspiration from literally. I I have I have my notepad and I have ideas that that I want to get get written. But um, if I've been asked to write a commission. Which, which is what happens um, quite a few times. I have to park the story that, you know, I might want to write, my, the, you know, the particular narrative that I'm thinking about and kind of then think about, okay, I've got, I've got a commission, I've got to get this play written for this particular group or whatnot. So I still make sure that I'm only doing projects that I'm passionate about, but there's a different level of passion um, that I would associate with a commission than or or more of a commercial commission so putting something on for for a theater that on based on a particular theme that they they would like me to write about than actually just writing from the heart and writing a story that i believe i just need to get out of me so there's there's two different processes i go through one is more kind of clinical just getting the story out there and just trying to um work the piece but then you know when it's when it's my story i, I kind of I just take my time with it because I know that um, it may just take me longer to to um, to get to that point. So um, I guess in in response to the question, it's if it, if it's about inspiration for writing, it's about what's going on in my life at the time and what I'm able to draw from. Um, as I say, I grew up on a council estate, so who are the people I met there? Are their character voices? still do, are their voices you know in my head still can i can i put pieces of them into into the work and um, my family can i put little bits of of them into my work and, and and the experiences and situations that i've been in can i can i mold that into a particular um scene or or um yeah create create a piece around that um but then directing it it's more about um, what is the writer trying to say? And I'm trying to make it clear to the audience what the objective and mission is of the writer. So um, it's less about me, me at that point. It's more about what what the story is and how can I make that clearer to the audience? Because, you know, I know a lot of people, um, they always say to me, well a lot of people say to me theater is boring like they go to theater or they did watch it in school and they just found it boring they were sitting there for ages and whatnot and I remember even in even in the office where I worked in London um my my friend my good friend now actually uh but at the time he was like oh you're not playwriting thing now man that's dry like I've been to people's plays before and whatnot but I all I'm very conscious that I didn't grow up with people that were in the arts around me so I didn't I was very conscious that I wouldn't want to drag them into a theatre context and just bore them to death like I wanted to make sure the play was very much like it was very gripping so whenever I'm writing I'm thinking about okay why is this line in there I'm going through it with a fine tooth comb and I'm saying what is this adding to the script because the last thing you want is for your peers to be in an environment and and feel bored you know I, I pride myself on um, honest, on honesty and I expect them to be honest with me as well if they found it boring then then tell me but fortunately touch wood people haven't found my work boring because I'm very conscious of of pacing and making sure that everything is running smoothly and it's not just a lot of um, you know drivel uh, which it can feel like with a lot of a lot of theatre productions so um, I think because of that I'm just I make sure my work is very commercial you know, I made sure that it that it appeals to to a wide audience because the the people that I'm trying to attract with my work are not necessarily the people that are typical theatre goers. I'm trying to get people into the space that that look like me, that have been from where I've been from, can relate to the stories, and um, so that's that's very much uh, my perspective. You know, as a creative, but but more so as a director, it's about 
how can I help this writer to to um, to go on that journey and make sure that people aren't bored in the audience because that's that's the key, you know, keep people engaged. If people are if people are asking questions, then they then they are um, they're focusing. If people are saying, "Well, why did he put that there?" As long as you can answer that question for them at some stage in the in the piece, then you're in a good place. It's all about constantly getting the audience to ask questions. Oh, why did he say that? Oh no, why has he said that? What's going to be with the response from the other person? Why hasn't he responded? If you can keep getting the audience to ask why, then you've got a good piece. For sure, that sounds good. And just on that, you spoke about you write your plays for people, primarily for people who come from the area like you've come from, who aren't necessarily, who haven't necessarily been exposed to the arts like that growing up. Um, I know mm. you're working, you do a few things anyways, you know, in terms of giving back a few things. And you've got, in terms of writing specifically, you've got, um, what was it like the UK, what was it called? The Writers Club. You've right. got the Sorrel Park. Yeah. yeah, and then the thing with Sorrel Club um, Theatrical, you go, you do workshop with schools and things like that. So in a way, it's like you're trying to, you're giving back to the community in a way, but specifically with regards to the arts and writing. What role do you feel like the arts, writing, theatre, just all of that in general can or should play in the lives of people? Mm. So I think I think for me, if I like I say, if I go back to, to the school context, it was because of that teacher why I ever ended up going into the arts in general. So I'm thinking if people haven't had that experience of somebody telling them that this is a this is something viable, this is something that you can do. It's not to say that every every child I come across will want to be a good writer or, or or an actor, but at least you're giving them the option, you're giving them a choice, you're showing them that there is something there for you to do. And even if you don't want it to become a career for you, the, these are the benefits of writing and and you you need writing in in every um, facet of society you can't you can't just not do writing so why not just get proficient at it you know and you can either do that creatively or you can do it professionally but there is a purpose to writing it's not just trying to pass an exam you know you will need to draft emails you you will need to create documents even though a lot of young people, they want to do uh they a lot of them want to be youtubers now that's the new kind of uh that's the new thing i think being a youtuber and i'm thinking well you know youtubers still have the right copy they still have to generate an email list and, and make sure that they're engaging people with their written written word um it's it's very important for you to to know how to write and to to write proficiently so for me it's me being in the space and being visible i think that's the most important part rather than anything i'm going to say um so rather than anything that i can get them to do it's more about just saying you know this is what i do and this is how writing is important and can benefit you um so i think that that's specifically for the in terms of the school's context and the writers club is just because I I know and and I know we're going to go into the Black Pound stuff in a, in a minute, but because I'm in the entrepreneurial space, I know there's a lot of people that that are working maybe a nine to five job or they don't necessarily feel like they've got time to do anything creative. I think Writers Club is just about giving them an opportunity to take take a minute out the same way that I'm you know taking some time out to do this podcast. It's about giving them, you know, a, a platform to say, okay, all right, I know at three o'clock on this day, I'm going to go to the writers club, and um, I'm going to get some ideas down for for something that I want to write, or even if it's for um, something that I've got to do for work, a piece of copy or marketing, you know, um, or a portfolio, is something that I can bring to this space and and um, tap into the expertise of those who are in the room with them. So even if it's just for an hour, just having a little conversation about writing, that just gives people a new a new energy and a new motivation. And I've definitely found benefit in that. Even if I haven't got any writing to bring, just hearing people with a passion for writing, you know, it just makes you just makes you want to do it. Um, and you know, it makes you want to just continue. Yeah, just makes you want to continue and 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 know um, why you're doing it as well. 
for sure. That's all good. Thank you for that. So, yeah, I want to talk about the Black Pounds project, like you just alluded to just now. Quickly, before we go there, so I wanted to talk on the Black Lives Matter movement. So I heard, I don't know where, I think it was another podcast I was listening to that you were on and you spoke about that, and in particular, the George Floyd murder. And I know that happened around, pretty much around the same time you started the Black Pounds project. And what's interesting with that is that I've spoken with a few people now for this podcast. So like the first person I spoke to was Samantha Pattinson. She works in fashion and she spoke about how that mm. changed things within her industry. And I spoke with some, well, actually the person just before you, she's Natalie Campbell. She works um, CEO of Belly Water and she spoke about what changed with her in her world and her industry. And although that happened overseas, I've spoken with loads of people, even outside of the interviews, just loads of people in day-to-day life, in my own life. You can see how it's properly rippled over, over here and fundamentally changed, I think, a lot of people's thinking and mindsets, black, white, everybody. And I'm just wondering, for you in particular, was was the was the motivation behind Black Pounds, was it, was there, was he motivated by the George Floyd murder and yeah just how did that affect you as a person i think subconsciously so <clears throat> I'll, I'll come more to the the george floyd uh but uh in a second but i think more more subconsciously i have always wanted to i've always seen value in entrepreneurship so i've always seen value in being able to to kind of have um, a little bit more autonomy over my time, having a little bit more flexibility, particularly as a writer, I sometimes just need that time to have heads, a clear headspace. But I'd set up multiple businesses. You know, I did a I did a video on my YouTube about my first failed business, which was a clothing line. You know, I tried to set up a clothing line because I saw people were doing that, particularly in 2015, 14, 15, people were just setting up clothing lines, you know, for jokes. So I just set thought, you know, okay, I'm going to pump some money into this um, and I'm gonna gonna just try a thing. Didn't have any business acumen, really. Didn't know anything about getting an accountant. Didn't know anything about you know professional photography and whatever. So I just literally went in all guns blazing. Probably spent money on the wrong things, and until eventually I just realised, okay, I'm just losing money here. So I just scrapped it. Um, then so, but but obviously that was a, it. Was a, it was as a result of not having information and access around me to, to people that knew about business and, and and things like that i kind of just tried to do it on my own and so more to the point um you know fast fast forward i set up a business as you say sorrel park going into schools teaching writing but when covid happened i wasn't able to get into any schools so my business again you know i, I was doing well you know i was getting into schools across across the midland region and then COVID happened and, you know, basically all my schools shut down. So I literally had no business. Um, didn't know how to take things online. I didn't know that I could have created resource packs and all of these things for the children. And, you know, I just didn't think about any of that because I didn't have people around me. So I was just more thinking, OK, well, I need to find a way to make money. So, you know, as I was working, I, so I secured a role um, working in the Birmingham rep and when the George Floyd murder happened obviously I was in a period of of um, reflection anyway as we all were but this this just felt different because of course everybody was in lockdown you know nobody could hide from it nobody could run away from this the fact of what happened in America and it started to highlight some of the things that were going on here actually a lot of the things that were going on here um, but what was more significant for me was when the protests were happening in Birmingham, the Black Lives Matter protests, they were right outside the, the Birmingham Rep, my, my place of work. But I saw people from all different communities coming together. It wasn't just black people. It was, and I'm sure it was the same in, in London as well. Um, there were people from different walks of life coming. There were white people, black people, Asian people. And I just thought, okay well this is a beautiful thing you know with we, we're seeing a lot a, a lot of people coming together in solidarity saying the same thing but what are we going to do to sustain this you know how are we going to make sure that people who want to help have a have a space to do that um and so obviously piecing together my experiences as an entrepreneur and how my business kind of 
crumbled at that time. I knew that there must have been thousands, if not millions of people across the UK that, that um, particularly were from our community that um, needed some support, you know, uh, whether that was just how to access some finance or funding or how to, um, you know, grow or build their business or start a business even because people were losing their jobs at that time as well. So it I, it was just impressed on my heart to to do something. And I know that a lot of people created a lot of initiatives at that time because everybody was feeling like, I want to do something, I want to do something. But for me, I, I wasn't too concerned about the pace at which it happened. I just thought, I'm just going to do something similar to you and you you know with a thousand voices you you have that that um motivation and you just you're just going to do it it doesn't really matter how long it takes you just know that this is something that that's been impressed on you to do and so with the black pounds i literally set up a fundraising campaign and i said um you know imagine if we all gave two pounds what could we do with that money so imagining there's what 6,000, 7,000 people at the protest. Imagine if everybody gave two pounds, what could we do with that to, to support people? So it's all well and good spending money on paint and making a pick, a pick art to say Black Lives Matter, but we could have stopped, you know, not saying that protests aren't important, but we could have used the two pounds that we spent on paint to club together and, and you know, create, uh, create something tangible. And so that was that was my mindset. And I think it was, you know, so simple but also radical at the same time i got a lot of people saying well what are you going to do with the money blah 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 but my idea was was initially to to raise some money and and just to go back a bit so i put that out there as a as a crowdfunder i said if everybody goes gave two pounds you know what could we do with the money big changes come from small change and we're talking about the the physical change as in the money change in your pocket but also change we can make change with the change and so I, within three weeks i had six thousand pounds raised and i thought okay well this has uh, clearly resonated with people so let me try and do some now let me figure out what to do with this so um i my initial intention was to was to kind of create small micro grants and kind of help businesses to to start you know to, we've set up costs and things like that that was my initial thing but then you know my wife she asked me okay well once that money's gone once you've done that what what happens then you know and I was just kind of like well you know we've we've done something we've we've helped we've and she was like but that's not sustainable and your whole thing was about sustainability you know how are you going to so that 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 helps okay what a couple hundred businesses but what about the, the thousands, millions of businesses that, that still need support after that? And so it really made me reflect again, you know, as a writer, I knew about reflection and taking and critique on board. So everything had, had kind of come full circle with that. Um, because, you know, it, maybe me a few years ago, I would have been like, oh, well, why are you asking that question? And I would have just carried on doing it the way I was doing it, but it made me reflect. So I thought, okay, instead of, instead of, given the money that way let's let's create a program let's get resources let's um you know create courses to do with financial education let's get some startup courses going let's you know be visible in the community give them checklists and all of these sorts of things so that it's it helps more people than just you know giving them a you know they, they say that you can you can give um give people money but that's not necessarily going to to help them know how to use it. So let's help them to create their own income. You know, let's give them the, the tools and the knowledge to do that for themselves so that then they can pass that on and so on and so forth. And, and again, building that community spirit. So fortunately, you know, because of the way, I think because of the way I went about it and because it wasn't about me per se, it was about, you know, bringing the community together. There were just loads of um, people that really believed in it. And like I say, people from all different walks of life, it wasn't just black people. It was people saying, you know, I've got a, 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 a certain skill set. You know, I've, I, I'm i an accountant or I've got experience in the art sector or I've got experience in, in mentoring or... So they all came in and were able to feed and add value and have conversations directly with the community, which was something that 
wasn't really happening before. So now you can come to the Black Panthers Project and say, you know, can I speak to someone about funding or can I speak to someone about, um, you know, I want to get into the art sector or I want to um, know if I should get an accountant. You know, you can easily access those types of conversations and speak directly with people that are volunteering their time to, to do that. So I, I realised that the project, um, it, it had real potential and real legs. And I think, fortunately, uh, the Black Pound Day came about at the same time. So, I mean, it's fortunately and unfortunately at the same time because people started to think we were we were both the same. But we, I believe that Black Pound Day is, is important in in raising awareness of 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 businesses and showing that you know um, there are very much <laughs> a community of businesses out here. Um, but I think for us, it's more about how are we going to ensure that those businesses are at the at the level to be competitive you know there's so many statistics out there that that talk about how we're not entering into certain sectors because we don't have the knowledge or know-how you know but for us it's about how can we help businesses to real realize their potential you know help them to realize that yes you may be you know um doing kind of a retail business you may have a book or things like that but how, could you get an ebook? Could you get this on on Amazon? Could you create a, a selection of books? Could you do like a bundle? So it's just giving them a little bit more um, clarity on where their business can go and uh, seeing your business as a separate entity to you. Obviously, you are the person leading it, but you can bring people into that. You can get people to do different parts of your business because a lot of because a lot of um, businesses from the black community are very much solopreneurs. You know, they do things. They do everything themselves. And so for us, it's about helping businesses to know how to scale the business, so that you're not kind of just staying in that micro level. Um, so we're, you know, we're really passionate about growth and Black Pound Day, of course, brings people together into a certain space. Um, and we just felt we wanted to to be business. So, so I think people obviously knew about the name Black Pound and Black Pounds just kind of <laughs> just was there as well. So um, it, it I think both, both of us just got traction from each other. And um, so, it, it, yeah. And I think, you know, moving forward, for me, it's all about collaboration. How can we work together, you know, rather than, you know, seeing each other? I mean, how many Black-owned groups are there on Facebook? If you, if you use Facebook, there's so many directories on there. I'm thinking, well, what, what, what are we doing with these? You know, there's so many businesses in there, but what's, what's going on? Are we all just going to say, yeah, like buy from me buy from me buy from me yeah well what's the difference between your business and your business you know if we connected a little bit more and understood the value of collaboration i think we'd be a lot further so you know for us we we we're, we're here you know we're going to be visible we're going to continue to provide the resources um but we're not we're not here to be um we're, we're just here to support ultimately we're, we're here to support whether it's a directory that needs some support or whether it's you know even black pound day if they need some support we, we're here we've got resources so um you know that's that's how it all came about and that's why i'm inspired to to continue doing it for sure that's sick and just done that with the black pounds project so this i don't even know when this is going to come out it's february now it's probably going to come out like may or something or something like that but backtrack a bit because when we started a thousand voices one of my one of the founding ethos was to promote entrepreneurship as well um i feel like it's definitely something that's very important and you know like you said there's all sorts of statistics on all sorts of bad things you know like economics and wealth and wealth gaps etc cetera, etc cetera. and we're like okay cool what can we tangibly do to try and close that gap so when we started this i wanted to run a competition of some sort something simple i thought you know what to run a competition of some sort to get back to the community and i wanted to do something in which we can empower an entrepreneur that needs some sort of help so i'm looking around looking for people to partner with and i come across your organization the black pounds project and i would definitely say that i think it's excellent value compared to other things i've come across anyway no disrespect to everybody else obviously everybody's offering what they're offering they got expertise in whatever areas they've got expertise in but the black pounds project i thought was very very good um good what what's the word like value and especially for what you get 
calls every single month and reviews and access to this and that and blah 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 like it was very very good value and when i spoke to you as well because i always like to speak to people as well you know just you know get a feel for who you're working with and their energy and everything like that I definitely feel what you're saying i feel like you're, you're definitely yeah I, I guess you definitely have a heart for for this you know for wanting to help and empower other people so for sure if you're listening i definitely say check out black pounds project good value and a very good package that they offer as well but um moving on yeah i just want to talk about so i feel that it takes a certain type of drive you know to do a lot of the things that you've done there's easier things to do you know what i'm saying there's you could have got a nine to five or i, I don't know i don't know exactly how this you know the theater or the arts is probably set up but i'm sure you could probably get a nine to five even as a playwright and then wouldn't have to worry about having to now go and set up your own thing and put in your own productions and even run black pounds etc cetera, etc cetera. it's probably there's easier paths to take isn't there but i feel like it takes a certain type of drive to do what you're doing and push through with it especially when i'm guessing i'm assuming there must have been very very tough points along that road as well what would you attribute that drive to wow good question um i have to i, I have to I have to piece it back to, well, I, I'll, I'll attribute a, a big chunk of it to my wife because she she was very much um, like, you know, you've got a talent in, in writing. Um, you, you have a natural affinity for, for helping people. Just just do it. And there wasn't that, she wasn't giving me that pressure to like, you know, get a, get a nine to five or worry about my finances at that point. She She's a teacher, so she knew that she was going to, you know, get the finances going at, at the end of the month and whatnot. So she was, you know, very, just very much supportive of me. And she knew, she just believed in me probably more than I did at my, than myself at that point. So I definitely attribute it to her um, a lot of why I was able to be as driven because one, I knew I just wanted to make her proud, you know, and I know that I was giving it everything because she'd given me this opportunity to just be free and and you know um make things work um but then i think the the drive comes from knowing that we there are people out there that don't come from where we come from and they're able to be like this they're able to be free thinkers and and you know think of, and and just do things that they want to do so i was like well i want to be able to to not only just create a platform for myself, but show to other people and also give people a, an idea of how it works, how the system works, um, to be able to break free from the mold a little bit. You still have to, you have to work very, very hard. So, you know, when, I, when I'm working from home, a lot of people think that you're just sitting at home, you know, in your boxer shorts, just chilling, scrolling down social media. No, you, you like, your emails are going like you're you you are create you are constantly driving the the work that comes in you know if you're not working you're not getting paid so you've got to continually be grafting and sometimes it's grafting for for a paycheck that you don't even know is coming yet so you're writing proposals you're creating projects you're you know creating systems um just just to try and get paid so i'd say the drive comes from just just knowing that i don't want to go back to it's not that i don't want to go back to to nine to five because i think they're very important particularly at a certain point in my life it was very important for me to have a nine to five to understand how to navigate certain situations how to communicate and 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 it humbles you as well you know having a boss saying where are you you're running late all of this quite kind of thing that that humbles you so I never tell people don't go and get a job because at the end of the day, go and get a job, learn the skills. And sometimes it might be for you. Maybe the nine to five route is for you and you you enjoy that that comfortability of knowing you're getting money at the end of the month and you, you can do your things on the side of that. That's brilliant. But for me, because of the, the career choice of wanting to be a writer, I need I need time. And uh, unfortunately, w when you work in a certain environment you know nine to five job it, it won't you can only get your certain two three weeks you know holiday and in that time i'd be trying to write my plays so i wouldn't really be having a holiday so for me i need to be able to say okay i'm going to work hard for i'm going to work solidly for these four or five days maybe even on the weekend 
but I'm going to take, you know, a day, you know, a week off here and just write. So for me, it was, it was very strategic. I knew that I wasn't going to be able to just, just sustain the writing career on its own. I had to do things around that. And I think, like I say, the drive has come from the support that, that I've had, but also just that desire to know I want to, I want to make um, society better for myself, but also for others who might want to go this route as well. For sure. All right. So on your journey so far, whether personally or professionally, what would you say has been your highest high and your lowest low? My highest high has, has to be um, having my work performed, uh, I'll just say in theatre, just having my work, it, it's not even so much the, the work performed actually, it's it's being in a position where people are resonating with, with your story enough to want to put it on stage. You know, it's not it's not all about the end product, it's about the journey that you go on because you know, a, a play or, or even if it's a film, it's it's a visual thing. So it's not like a novel or a, um, a or a story, you know, a short story. It's 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 visual. It's written to be visual. So that you know that that playwriting is is about the craft. You know, being a write for something is a, is a craft. So it's about that three dimensional reality, being able to to picture it before it's even gone on the stage. So the fact that people come on that journey with you and see that um, with you before it's even getting onto the stage. That's my highest high. So I'd say highest high, you know, if I want to put it in, in actual terms, would have been Shadows in London because that was the very first time, you know, somebody had believed in me enough to invest money in my work. That That's, you know, um, almost unheard of really for, for someone like me to just get that. So I'm um, very thankful to, to Kevin, but also the creative team as well. Um, and my lowest low was actually off the back of, off the back of that success, nothing came. Um, you know, nothing, nothing came at that time. So I was expecting, okay, okay, I've got these reviews. I've I've come out. You know, I actually ended up leaving my job because I was like, okay, I, I, you know, I'm getting somewhere now. And then I was applying for more creative roles, and I was just rejection after rejection after rejection. I was like, well, why am I getting rejected? Like I had but there were there's a whole like nuanced thing that goes into that i was told that my voice was too brash when i was doing one of the workshops i thought i was told my voice is too deep for radio all these kind of things and this was all pre-george floyd so i don't think people would come with that energy now but at that time it was very much like ah uh, it's not the right not quite the right fit um for this and and there, there were other things as well like i was turning up to interviews in a three-piece suit and stuff for the creative sector and apparently that's not what you do you're supposed to go a bit more relaxed and so all these nuanced <laughs> all these nuanced things that i didn't know about and so i was just getting rejection after rejection after rejection and so I, that's why i ended up having to come back to birmingham because i didn't i didn't get a job in london in the, in the sector that i'd want and I'd, and I'd left my job so I had to come back and I felt like a failure, but then, you know, that gave me a new motivation to say, okay, well, you guys are going to reject me. Let me show you then, because I'm not going to, I'm not giving up like that. I think I was, I think I was rejected from 15 first interviews. So it was probably technically about, ah, oh, it was so many. I couldn't, but I was always getting through the door. So I knew I was doing something right, but then it was probably the suit. <laughs> Maybe the suit was what, what was throwing them off, but nobody told me, oh, no, somebody could have dropped me a line and said, oh, you know what, maybe just go in a little, you know, something a bit more casual, maybe don't turn up in a suit. But that's what I'm saying. So hopefully, and, and it's ironic that one of the guys that I mentor at, at the Birmingham Rep, um, he, he actually asked me, what should I wear to this interview? And I said, go smart, casual, do not wear a suit. His mom was telling him wear a suit. I said, no, nah, don't wear a suit. Just wear, a, you know, a shirt, check shirt, jeans, keep it casual. You know, you don't need, it's not that kind of thing. Um, but of course we're coming from a different a different background. You know, our parents are more corporate. So that's how you go, you go, you go sharp, get in a suit and tie in. But art sector's not quite like that. So it's all those nuanced things. I would be able to look past that. But I think at that time, they weren't willing to look past, you know, my inexperience in that regard. So yeah, that was the lowest low, getting all those rejections, but it's made me, made me stronger now. and you know when i'm doing my when i'm interviewing people um now i'm always 
I'm always aware of where they might have come from and where where they might not be aware of how the culture, the working culture is. So I give people the benefit of the doubt as much as, as much as possible. But yeah, that was a difficult time for me, definitely. Yeah, that's, that's all good. Advice for anyone in the creative sector, don't turn up to your interview in a three-piece suit. <laughs> I've made that mistake myself a couple of times. But <laughs> some people don't know. I've done my undergrad at London profession. And I remember turning up to my interview in a three-piece suit. And then people were just like casual. Like, and I'm like, when I got to that, I'm, like, I'm way overdressed. <laughs> way, way overdressed. But cool. <laughs> Learned the hard way. But that's all good, man. Um, mm. quickly, so before we go into quick fire questions, I always like to end off with this question. What do you want your legacy to be? Ooh, these are good questions, man. When I'm doing my interviews, I'm going to use some of these questions. They're really good. Um, what do I want my legacy to be? I I just want to remember, be remembered for, for doing good work. You know, I don't want to be remembered for for you know being being a rich guy or you know just not really doing anything positive. I want to be well. Of course, if wealth comes along with it, then that's that that would be great. But I'm not. I don't want to be remembered just for that. I want to be remembered for the for the work that I did and how I help people, and um, how my work has you know whether it's my writing, how that has resonated with people and 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 that can live on you know once i'm gone so that that's my that would be you know what i'd live for really long for that's it nice one all right cool that's all good cj so let's go into some quick fire yeah so let me get them up uh, cool yeah all right so i've got 10 questions yeah it's literally just whatever comes to your head first and i think the way i've sort of formatted it is that the first few technically should be a bit easier than the last as you're going down they get a bit more difficult but yeah whoever comes to your head first and we go with that so cool all right you're good to go i just have to answer straight away well you could take a moment to think if you need to but yeah <laughs> you just answer quickly i guess all right cool okay. let's go first question what's your favorite movie uh I say Shawshank Redemption. Okay, good movie. All right, second one. What's your favorite book? Um, or favorite book? I, I my favorite book at the moment is actually a book by a lady called Jude June. Is it Jude? Jude Jennison. Um, and it's it's a coaching book. Uh, it's called Opus. Cool. All right, third one. Name a song that you can never get bored of. Um, I'm actually at the moment. I'm listening to Lucky Day, Roll Some More. I don't know why I just like that song so much, but yeah. <laughs> cool, <laughs> cool. All right, next one. If you can only eat one food for the rest of your life, what would you pick? Um, probably sweet and sour chicken and rice. Just yeah, I can work with that. Yeah, good choice. All right, next. How do you start your day? Uh, I'd usually go to the gym in the morning and then I'd have some breakfast and then I'd get the laptop out. Cool. All right, next. Name three people that inspire you. Uh, my wife, Will Smith. Will Smith, yeah, Will Smith. He's been doing some weird stuff recently, but um, yeah, I'd say Will Smith. And then um, also... Uh, my granddad as well. He sadly passed away, but yeah, my granddad. All right, that's good. Next, what's the best advice that you ever received? Um, it would probably, it would probably, probably have been that nothing's real. So just get on with it. That that's kind of a thing of getting over imposter syndrome and things like that. Nothing's real. Everybody's performing in some sense so just do it that's cool all right next one if you were to dedicate the rest of your life to one charitable cause what would you pick i'd pick black pounds perfect all right we're on the last two so next question what's the kindest thing that somebody has ever done for you 
I don't know. People do many kind things for me. Um, I would say probably probably more recently, uh, Denise came to a meeting because, um, yeah, she I, I really needed someone to come to the meeting with me and she just came and she didn't ask any questions. She just did it. So, yeah, thank you, Denise, for that. Great. Thank you, Denise. And the last one, what's one thing people don't know about you? I th oh, what do they know about me? Is this anyone, what anyone wouldn't know about me or? Just, just the, the general person. General person probably doesn't know that I play the piano. Ah, cool. Cool. That's quite cool. All right. That's that. Cool. So that's the interview done, basically. Before we wrap up properly, have you got any closing remarks? Um, no, I think it's been, it's been a really, it's been really nice to reflect. So thank you so much for the questions you've asked. And, um, I think anybody that, that has a passion for something and, and at the risk of sounding cliche, just don't give up because it just is a part of you. I think sometimes we try to detach ourselves from our purpose, but when the two align, when your purpose meets your passion, you know, the, the possibilities are endless. So just, just keep striving. And, um, you know, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, it's CJ Lloyd Webley on Instagram and CJ Lloyd Webley.com you can approach me that way as, as, uh, Tevin did. Cool. All right. That's that. So thank you once again for coming into the podcast, CJ. Very, very much appreciate your time this afternoon and yeah, man, for sharing your story, sharing some gems and for everything you've, you know, reflected and shared with us. Um, sure people are going to find it very useful and inspiring so thank you once again and that was that that was this is a thousand voices that was cj lloyd webley and we're out okay my people thank you for tuning into this interview once again is always very very much appreciated if you haven't subscribed yet then please do subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to this interview on right now and let us know what you thought about this interview it's always good to hear feedback from the community what were your key takeaways and what do you think about the 1000 voices concept in general leave a comment or a review wherever you're listening to this and let us know Next week, we've got another very, very special guest on the podcast. As always, the episode is going to drop next week, Tuesday, and the full YouTube video will follow on a couple of days afterwards. If you'd like to see some previews from the episode, please do follow us on our social media pages at A Thousand Voices UK, and we'll be uploading some previews over the next couple of days. But that's that for now. Thank you once again for tuning in. That was CJ Lloyd Webley. This is 1000 Voices, and for now, we're out. <laughs>